Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, so let's just pick up from uh, the next chapter. We'll get into chapter 15. Let me just uh, post the notes. Sorry, just give me one moment, please. Sorry, uh, I'm just trying to get the notes. Okay, for some reason I'm unable to present right now. Uh, let me just check. Okay, so we'll just continue and uh, uh, well, I, I don't know, I, for some reason it's not showing on the project screen. Uh, let me present, see it again. Yeah, okay, it's up now. Sorry about that. Okay, so chapter 15. Now, uh, after addressing the topic of spiritual gifts and um, uh, you know proper expression of those spiritual gifts, Paul turns his attention to another topic, which is very important, which is the resurrection from the dead. Right now, regarding the resurrection of the dead, there were two main concerns. First, was was there a life after death, and two, what kind of bodies? we will have when we are raised from the dead. Now, uh, one of the things that we must understand is even the Gentiles, some of them believed in resurrection. I mean, they, they believed in an afterlife, right? Uh, and so let's see what Paul is teaching uh, the church here. Okay, let's get into chapter 15, verse 1 onwards, right? Uh, the gospel and the resurrection. So Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which you also are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Now he goes on to the scriptures, For I believe to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, right, and that he was buried, and he rose again, and on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but, have, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. Right. So now, it's so wonderful how the Apostle Paul is bringing this whole aspect of resurrection. You see, Paul doesn't you know, start off by saying, yes, there is a resurrection. Uh, we have to believe in the resurrection. He doesn't say that. He's, he's giving a, a defense for what he's going to say. He's saying, listen, we as believers, as a church, we must hold fast to what is being preached. Right? Because when I came to you at Corinth, I told you, about the Lord Jesus Christ. I preach the gospel with you. What is the message I preach to you? I preach that Jesus Christ was buried. He, he died. Christ died for our sins. He buried. He, was, he rose again. And he, he rose again. He was seen by Cephas and then by the 12 disciples. And after that, he was seen by over 500 people. right? And then he was also seen by uh, James and the other apostles. And he was seen... I myself have seen him. So Paul is trying to bring out this. Now, you can fool one person. You can fool two. You can't fool more than 500 people at the same time. So Christ's death, burial, and resurrection took place according to the scripture. So Paul is trying to say, we must hold fast. There will be winds of doctrines that are coming and that are saying, that's what happened in the Thessalonica church and Thessalonians, where they were saying, uh, oh, the rapture's already happened. And Paul is still writing to them and saying, no, it's not happened because when we know there'll be a trumpet sound and a twinkling of an eye, we will change. So there will be people who will, enemies who will try to take away this understanding, other influences. They'll try to you know, take this away from us. Two, 
there will be people in, 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 when if we let go of this message of the gospel we have believed in vain now what is the point if jesus died he took our sins he died he was buried but he didn't rise again if he didn't if there is no resurrection our belief will be in vain because it it's it's there's no victory there if jesus died on the cross took up our sins and he died and he's buried if there's no resurrection there's no victory and if there's no victory we are still living in sin and if we are still living in sin whatever we have preached whatever we believed in it's all in vain so paul is saying you need to hold on to the gospel that we have preached then verse 9 onwards he says for i am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called apostles because i persecuted the church but by the grace of god i am what i am and his grace towards me was not in vain but i labored more abundantly than they all but yet not i but the grace of god which was with me therefore whether it was i or they so we preach and so you believed now paul is again remembering that he was a persecutor of the church right he persecuted the church now here's the thing grace and works are two sides of a coin you remember james what he says he says uh, faith without deeds is of no use i can have faith that move mountain but if i don't work on it it's of no use again there's grace there's work so paul is pointing out and he's saying we put all the 12 disciples together i did more than all of them I labored more than them, and which is true. He labored more than all the uh, apostles. And yet, he says this labor was not out of his own ability, but God's empowering grace that was upon his life. So he's saying, yes, I labored. I worked hard. Right? I traveled to places. I went through all the turmoils, challenges, and difficulties, and shipwrecks, and beaten with rods, and perils against the, my foes. And I've gone through all of this. I've, I've labored, yet I've labored through the empowering grace of God. Because if I tried to do it on my own, I would have failed. But I did labor. You see that? It's side, two sides of one coin. So Paul is saying, it's a very important lesson for us. We have to work hard in our life, but we depend on the grace of God. So whether we reach high levels in our workplace or we become really great in ministry or God has just raised, up, raised us up very high, it may be our hard work, but never forget it is the grace of God that has empowered us. Right? Yes, we worked hard, we stayed up nights, we stayed up, worked, you know, gave many hours working, and then we are seeing success in our life. We can't say, because I worked hard, I, have, I can see success. Then if I say that, then the grace of God is left empty there. I say, God, by God's grace, I, was, I worked hard, and by God's grace, He has helped me gain success. Right? Then He goes on to talk about the issue here now if christ is preached verse 12 if christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead but if there's no resurrection of the dead then christ is not risen and if christ is not risen then our preaching is empty and your faith also is empty yes and we are found false witnesses of god because we have testified of god that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. So, so then he, the last verse is, in, if in this life, only we have hope in Christ, then we of all men are most pitiful. Right? Uh, so Paul is saying, listen, 
the Christian faith depends on this one truth. There has to be a resurrection. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, that means we are false prophets. We are false teachers. And we are being false witnesses have shared with you something false. And you are believing something false. Your faith is... Uh, you know, uh, is empty. My faith is empty. I will have to go through judgment of God. And out of all the people, better are the Gentiles than uh, us because we are the most pitiable people. If there is, if the resurrection is not there. So then Paul is saying, so of course there is a resurrection. There is a resurrection because Christ has resurrected. He goes on verse twenty, but now Christ is risen from the dead. And has become the first fruits of those who has fallen asleep. Right? I like that word first fruit. We'll talk about it. Uh, for since since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Very powerful. That each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits after those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end. He, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is expected. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So what a powerful, powerful defense here. He's saying, Christ has risen from the dead and he is our first fruits. The Greek word for first fruits means a parquet, which is the beginning of a thing. Right? Adam was a first fruit of death. Because of Adam, there is death. But because of Christ, because he resurrected from the dead, we are the first fruits of resurrection. So we all will get, will be moving from this physical flesh body of the flesh to the incorruptible the spirit a spiritual body a glorified body and i love how paul writes to thessalonians he says in the twinkling of an eye we will get a glorified body what a joy right and paul is trying to let the church here in corinth know listen jesus was resurrected 500 people and more saw him they testify of him. He has a glorified body. So he's our first fruit. We also, if we just die and if there's no resurrection, what is the use? How can it be that only Jesus resurrects and we, we can't? No. The resurrection of Jesus represents our resurrection. The book of John says, because he lives, we will live. And this is such a wonderful assurance for us, right? Uh, imagine as believers, uh, you know, death is something that we'll all have to taste one day or the other. We can't run away from it. Uh, but there's this wonderful assurance that to be absent with the Lord is to be present. Sorry, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. You'll have a resurrected body, a glorified, incorruptible body. And Paul writes in many places and says that we will see him as he is. Right? Uh, now, verse 24 to 28, he's talking about uh, uh, where, you know, all the enemies, including death itself, will be ended and there'll be no death. He's talking about this thousand-year millennium period in uh, where Christ will come after the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, he will come. He will come to uh, Jerusalem in the temple that is built. He will come and sit there and rule there as king over a thousand-year period. Right, till all his enemies, he will rule with an iron scepter, Isaiah says. Right, uh, and all his enemies will be brought under his feet. The enemy, which means the devil, will be, uh, you know, bound for those thousand years. Right, so Jesus Himself will come 
in his resurrected body and he will live in that thousand year millennium so so he's again paul is trying to again encourage the church saying we have this assurance right it's not like jesus is resurrected he's never going to come back no he's going to come back in his resurrected body he will come he will live for thousand years he will he will defeat uh, every rule every reign of the enemy uh, all the enemies will be under his feet and he, this is the resurrected king so much so verse 29 onwards he goes on there's in in light of this resurrection we also uh, must learn certain things what is it verse 29 what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all why then are they baptized for the dead and why do we stand in jeopardy every hour i affirm by boasting in you which i have in christ jesus our lord i die daily if in the manner of men i have fought with beasts of ephesus what advantages is it to me if dead do not rise let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die do not be deceived evil company corrupts good habits awake to righteousness and do not sin for some do not have the knowledge of god i speak of this to your shame now remember in in the introduction of of corinth we talked about the place right and remember one of the belief system in greece there were the Stoics, they were, uh, 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 I forget what's the other one, the Stoics. Uh, it's there in the book of Acts. Yeah, the Epicurean and the Stoics, those two beliefs. Uh, Acts chapter, let's give you that verse. Acts 17, where Paul is in Athens, uh, again in Greece. So they were, they were these two beliefs, the Epicurean and the Stoics. Uh, and one of the beliefs was there is no resurrection we die we there's no afterlife there is nothing we die we just become a star or we go back into the heavenly places and we are just there as a star or we are something else now that maybe we could say that some of those beliefs have tried to creep into the church saying how can we die how can there be a resurrection no when we die we just become uh, a part of the galaxy or we become part of the cosmos around us maybe some of those belief systems have creeped into the church and paul is addressing that and he's saying if if, if that's the case let's just eat and drink and uh, for tomorrow we die he's saying why must i go through all these challenges all right in ephesus he says i fought beasts in ephesus basically saying the the uh, the wild the, the opponents the people who are uh Op op opposing apostle paul's ministry they were like wild animals they fought him like wild animals at ephesus right and he's saying there why should i endure all this why should i go through all of this if there's no resurrection from the dead right i, I i'm looking at all my challenges and i'm uh, and i'm saying why should i go through all this right Verse 29, let's, let's go up. He points that outside of the church, there are people who are unbelievers. This was another belief system where they would baptize the dead. So there's a dead body. They would take that body, put it into, immerse it into water. And then uh, it was, it was uh, in a way of saying that we have, uh, you know, cleansed the body or we're believing that, you know, someday they will have life and they will, do good or something like that right they have some kind of a belief system that was prominent at that time so paul is saying outside of the church they do that now they themselves don't see a resurrection of the dead but we have seen it so paul is not teaching that we should baptize the dead right he's just saying that there is a resurrection from the dead right outside the church people take a dead body baptize it in water but nothing happens they don't resurrect but here we have a resurrection from the dead so let that be our hope um and then he goes on uh, i think it's verse 33 and 34 let's just go back there 33 and 34 do not be deceived evil company corrupts good habits awake to righteousness and do not sin 
and he's saying don't be deceived evil company remember now this is some new understanding right if you we must always picture the church in corinth probably the church is growing many people are accepting the lord now people around are wanting to know what are their belief system why do they what is it that they believe in so they come in they're trying to bring in their ideologies their you know their forms of worship or their forms of understanding and that that is creeping into the church paul is saying bad company corrupts good habits avoid it avoid evil company right uh, don't allow people to influence you so easily right uh, uh, be assured that there is a resurrection people will come and say there's no resurrection don't just believe them but be assured right we must have uh, the knowledge of god to to uh, influence us in our lives more than what evil company does right just an application here we must live as people who believe and are convinced in the fact that christ is alive and therefore we will also live eternally with him so no matter what the hardships no matter what the challenges we face when we face it for the sake of god for the sake of christ there is a reward and we will you know there is a resurrection we see our challenges we see the things that happen in our life and we say okay one day we're doing it for god one day we will be rewarded for this it's not like what i'm doing is just nobody's going to see it no god is the rewarder right uh, and he's going to reward us for all that we have done right? two we have to guard our faith in the gospel and the resurrection right uh, there are those who do not have this understanding people are there around us even right now in the day and age that we are living in who don't believe in jesus don't believe in the resurrection and they may try to infiltrate try to influence us by their own understandings but how we live and the choices we make we must understand we must guard our faith and say no one thing i know that the lord jesus is god and he died for my sins he resurrected from the dead and i know that one day i will see him i'm not going to die and then become a star in heaven and the in the cosmos or become a you know something just merge with the sky no i i will get a glorified body i will stand with him face to face right and and that's that's something that we must walk in every day of our lives when we see those challenges say god help me to overcome these challenges right then he talks about the glorious body uh verse 35 onwards a glorious incorruptible and a resurrection body so what does he say here this uh portion of scripture here let's read that together verse 35 but someone will say how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come foolish one what you sow is not made alive unless it dies and what you sow you do not sow that body that shall be but mere grain perhaps wheat or some other grain but god gives it a body as he pleases and to eat seed its own body you see how powerfully paul is just he's saying how can people will ask you how can the dead rise be raised up no our organs are not working the heart is not pumping there's no blood in the body there's no blood flow the brain is not functioning how can the dead rise so paul is saying okay you look at a seed take a mango seed or a apple seed when you're putting the seed you don't see an apple when you're putting the seed so what he's trying to say here is there is no body to the seed it's just a seed but when you put it to the ground if it's an apple seed the it sprouts up and god gives the body to that seed that the to make it look like an apple or a mango whatever fruit it is but the seed is just a seed right so paul is using this he's, he's just using this example and now he's going on verse 39 all flesh is not the same flesh but there is one kind of flesh of men another flesh of animals another of fish another of birds 
there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the telestial, terrestrial is one. <clears throat> there is one glory of the sun, there's another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, and for one star differs from another star in glory. So also the resurrection from the dead. The body is sown in corruption. So when we die, yes, we are washed, we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus, but death itself is corruption. We die. You know, the, the Bible says that uh, sin has caused death. Right? We die because of the fact that there is sin in this world. It is corruption because of what Adam did. That one sin brought corruption into the entire world, and now we die. But it is raised in incorruption. What a powerful sentence, right? As our physical body will die, but it is raised in incorruption. In so when we get a glorified body, there's not going to be pride, there's not going to be anger, there's not going to be lust, there's not going to be jealousy, there's nothing. An incorruptible body. It's raised in incorruption. The body is never going to die again. It's a glorified body. Like how Jesus right now, the body is not going to die. They saw Jesus. Right? They saw him. Thomas says, let me put my finger in, only then I'll believe. He said, okay, come. So a, but that's an incorruptible body. It's not going to die again. That's the body we are going to get. It is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. So wonderfully, Paul is explaining this to the church, saying, you look at the stars, you look at the animals. One star has another glory, the other star has another glory. You look at the moon and the sun, they have different kinds of glory. The sun looks beautiful in its own way, the moon looks beautiful in its own way. But they are all different. So much so, even each one of us, when we die, when we get a resurrected body, we will all be different, but we will all be a spiritual body in our own glory. Right? Verse 45. <clears throat> and so it is written. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. And after that is the spiritual. Right? So the natural happens. You know, the spiritual is not going to happen just like that. Right? First, the natural should happen. A, a, a natural death. And then comes the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord of heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. Right? And is, also, and is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image, the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Right? It's so wonderful. Paul is saying here, Adam was born out of the dust of the earth. We will also, being formed, we will go back to the dust of the earth. But the second man was born of heaven. He didn't go back to the dust of the earth. Right? He came from heaven. So but so, each one of us also, Yes, we will go back to dust, but there will be a heavenly man. The, he was the first fruit, the heavenly man, son of man, Jesus. We will also become heavenly. We have borne the image of the man of dust. We have two eyes, nose, mouth, ears. God created from the dust. We all have the same image. But 
we will all bear the image of Christ, the heavenly man. And the glorified body, there's no sin. There's no sin. There's going to be the image of God. We will be just like he is in this incorruptible body. So Paul is saying these the resurrected bodies, we, we will have our immortal, incorruptible, spiritual, raised up in glory and in power. We shall be like him, John 1 John 3, 2. We shall be like him, or we shall see him as he is. You know, this verse always gives me goosebumps. We shall be like him. How can we, you know, right now we are trying to be more Christ-like, right? Yes, that's good. Right? We that's our goal to live a life like how Christ lived. But maybe we are we may achieve it to a certain level. We may not achieve it to a certain level. But what an assurance we have that the glorified body shall be like we shall be like him. And we shall see Jesus just as he is. And uh, he's, he's just telling the church, listen, there is a resurrection. You get ready for your body to get a glorified body. We shall be like him and we shall see him in his glorified body. So then he's ending this whole chapter with a final victory. Right? He's, he's, he's brought this whole understanding. He's told the church, listen, people will come. You hold fast to what we have preached because there is going to be a death. But there is also going to be a resurrection. Right? Finally, verse 50 to 58. Now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment. Again, he's talking about what happens in the rapture. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on, sorry, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal should put on immortality. So when this corruptible puts on incorruption and this mortal puts on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Powerful, powerful, powerful uh, closing sentences by Apostle Paul. There will come a time. Brethren, if you want to understand this, we know that Jesus is in heaven. Now, how can flesh and blood cannot go to heaven? One. Now the corrupt ca cannot inherit, inherit something that is there's, where there is incorruption. So what is going to happen? In the twinkling of an eye, this corruptible body will get an incorruptible body. We shall be changed. Now this which is mortal, which has a lifetime limit of maybe 80, 90 years, will put on immortality. So in heaven, it's not going to be, okay, 90 years and then I'm going to die. There's no more death. There's no more mortality. The incorruptible, for the corruptible will put on incorruption. The mortal will become immortality. Now when that happens, the saying is coming true. Death, where is your victory? Well, which means Paul is trying to say, hey, we have overcome death. Natural death? Yes, that's true. It's there. We are away from this natural world. But it's not that we've 
we are doing nothing no we get an in, incorruptible body we we get immortality and we get to live with jesus for the rest of our lives there's no time limit there right now there's a time limit right so we're learning about god we're learning about god's word we are studying we're trying to be more christ like we can do that till maybe 80 90 90 years old and then there will be death but when the incorruptible comes in when the mortality is changed to immortality and we're in heaven we are seeing him as he is there is no death there is no time limit the bible says in the book of revelations there shall be praises to him forever and ever and ever there are no time limit we're not going to grow old and die we're not going to have body pain we're not going to have headaches nothing at that moment, for those who are alive in Christ, in an instant, we will have resurrected bodies. Death will be overcome. And this is the most powerful, powerful aspect of Christians, for us as Christians. That is not the end. right? Why is it that when we look around the world, you know, somebody sent me this video some time back. They sent me a video of two well, let me just stop sharing we stopped okay they sent me a video of two deaths uh, two deaths uh, i think it was a nurse in a hospital who took this video I, I i forget but i remember watching this video two deaths two different instances in two different uh, probably two different places both were on their final times of their death and there was this unbeliever in the video. Uh, I don't know if that video is available, but that's something that I saw. It's a personal uh, thing that I have seen, uh, where in the video, the person who was not a believer was crying and mourning and weeping and was in pain and screaming and shouting, just angry. But the believer was smiling, and there were tears of joy just coming. And they're saying, I can see him. And they're waiting to go. And this nurse is taking the video. And she couldn't understand uh, what was happening. And I think there's also a small clip of what she says. She says, if this is the death that all Christians have, I wouldn't mind becoming a Christian. Because I want this kind of a death. There was no, there was no hopelessness. There was no anger hatred nothing there was a joy because she knew a person knew that they're going to be with the lord jesus and that is a wonderful hope that we all have paul is writing to a church that is confused that you know probably are wondering what is my future when i die what 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 is it people are saying i'll become a star i'll join the cosmos and i'll become something in the on the earth well, some people are saying I've become nothing. There's no more nothing after life, after after death. But he's saying, no, there is going to be a glorious body, a glorious life ahead. And he 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 sums up this entire chapter in the last verse. He says, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Let no no person say this is false and move you. You be assured of this. They may say, how is it scientifically possible? You know, the Greeks are all intellectuals. They may say, you know, people may say, uh, this is not possible. It doesn't make sense. It's a, a foolish philosophy. Uh, they may speak all kinds of things. But you don't let it move you. Always give yourselves to the work of the Lord. Do what God has called you to do. Do it in honesty. Do it with integrity. Work hard. Uh, whether it's in ministry, whether it's in your know, uh, workplace, work hard, do it with integrity, honesty, and knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And he closes with that chapter, right? So finally, he goes into the next chapter, and the next chapter is very small. We'll just quickly look at it, uh, and then we will close.
Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Right. Okay. Um, yeah, just hold on. Yes, Christopher, please go ahead. Oh, Christopher, did you raise your hand? All right. Okay, uh, I think you may have by mistake uh, raised your hand. Okay, let's go to the last chapter. Let's quickly finish this, and then uh, next week we can move into Second Corinthians. Okay, so chapter 16. Now, after addressing the matters in the Corinthian church, he responded to questions that came in to a previous letter. Paul ends this chapter by just making a few closing statements, and he uh, it's more of you know caring and helping one another. Right? Uh, I don't know. If... Okay. Uh, oh, there's a problem with your mic, Christopher. Okay. Um... Okay, do you want to type in the question? Uh, you can probably type in the question. We'll just continue with the chapter, and then maybe at the end of the class, we'll try and answer your question. Right? I uh, hope that's okay. Right. So, 16 was 1 to 4. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, uh, so he's going back to a few practical aspects now. Before closing off, he wants to get practical, giving them some instructions. Uh, as I've given you orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week let each one of you lay aside something storing up as he may prosper that there may be no collections when i come and when i come whomever you approve by your letters i will send to bear your gift to jerusalem but it is fitting that i go also they will go with me now paul is uh, encouraging the church in corinth to um now, the churches in Corinth, Galatia, Antioch, Macedonia, they, in Jerusalem, they were going through a famine, right? And we know that the Jerusalem church was a huge church. They were also looking after widows. They, look, they were looking after the needs of people. Uh, and so they needed financial support. So Paul is here. He's encouraging the church. First day of the week. That means on Sunday, just go ahead and, prob as your heart leads you, keep something aside for... Uh, the church in Jerusalem, and uh, while we, it is important to bless others, meet people's needs. Uh, we must also give to other people, and we see that happening even in uh, the early church. Later on, Paul teaches the church. You know, he the, the people of uh, uh, Philippi always were giving to Paul. Uh, he says, "I I enjoyed the gifts that were sent to me, and they're a sweet smelling aroma in Christ." So. Um, he's trying to encourage the church to support the church in Jerusalem, right? Now, notice here it says the first day of the week. So the early church has transitioned from uh, meeting on the first day of the week, that is the Lord's Day, uh, uh, have transitioned from meeting on Saturday to the Sunday, right? Uh, and uh, they come together first day of the week, which is the Sunday, right? Now, this is very important, handling money matters. Notice what Paul is saying. He's being so careful and so prudent with, his, uh, with this whole thing of gifts. He's saying, you send people whom you choose. Right? I, I'm not taking the responsibility of this because I don't want anyone accusing me, saying I took some things from it or there's some misappropriation. So Paul is saying, as leaders, you all choose the right people. The people who you choose, you bring the gift and come to Jerusalem. And I will also come to Jerusalem there. I'll be there at Jerusalem. Right? So you see how Paul is being so careful. He's being wise. He's not saying, I'll come, you send the money to me, and I will take it to Jerusalem. No. Right? Now, would they have done it? Yes. But there could be a chance of people accusing Paul, saying, where's the money? Where, where is the gifts that we sent? Uh, we had sent so much, but where is it now? So Paul is taking things. He's being very wise, very prudent, and he's saying, uh, 
send the money through people who you know they will be in charge of it but i will meet him in jerusalem now why is this an important lesson for us you know in ministry or in now uh, in anything that we're doing whether it's the workplace and especially if it's ministry be very careful when it comes to money right now uh, some of the things that we do is we make sure that everything that we do is accounted for and everything is accounted for uh, uh, whether it is uh, given through cash or whether it's given online uh, we, if something's given through cash like our offerings a photo is taken there's a group of three or four people volunteers they they count uh, and that there's proof uh, counting and then they take a photo there is a, a register and the amount is written the sunday the amount uh, everything is you know put on paper as on document as well as uh, you know it's there on our uh, record so this way if there's any question that comes up we always have the records right and it's not the pastors who are doing all of this we always have a team we always have others so that we avoid this whole thing of you know getting into a problem and it's a wise thing right it's nothing wrong because now when we look at what's happening in around us there's misappropriation of funds isn't it sad when we see uh, people have been taken to court uh, and you know because of misappropriation ministries have been taken to court they don't know what has happened to the money money has come in money has gone but they don't know where is it gone so it's gone somewhere and the pastors held accountable so so apostle paul is just being very prudent here it may be something small but he's keeping his hands clean right uh, and then he goes on uh, talking about coordinating some ministry work he says i will come to you when i pass through macedonia uh, and for i do not verse seven i do not wish to see you now uh, on the way but i hope to stay a while with you if the lord permits i will tarry in ephesus until pentecost for a great do an effective door has opened to me and there are many adversities very important now there will be times there are adversities challenges and difficulties now in the midst of that god can open the right doors right now we cannot say i don't want these challenges i don't want these difficulties so uh, uh, i don't think that is a door which god has opened look at this paul is in ephesus right and previously he said they were like beasts right uh, they were like people who like animals they 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 were against me they opposed me they were willing to even kill me but paul is saying i do not wish to see you now but i hope to stay a while because a great door of ministry has opened for me but there are many adversaries right so very important learning recognizing divine opportunities right god may open a door for us but we must respond to that opportunity we must not see the adversaries the difficulties the challenges and stop entering the door right paul is saying the people in ephesus are terrible they, they i'm being beaten i probably they can kill me anytime right i don't know when they can come and just kill me but there's a great door of ministry probably the door is there are many lives being touched many of them coming to christ uh, uh, you know many families are coming to christ so there's a great door of ministry i need to teach them a little more so i'll stay on uh, and i will meet you later on in uh, jerusalem so very important we recognize what god is opening for us and we move in in spite of those challenges we move in in spite of challenges that may be there ahead but god knows how to help us overcome those challenges then he goes on finally he's encouraging young ministers saying 10 and 11 and if timothy comes see that he may be with you without fear for he does the work of the lord as i also do therefore let no one despise him but send him on his journey in peace that he may come to me for i'm waiting for him with the brethren now this is a very important lesson right uh, as ministers of god as we grow more you know established in ministry we become senior leaders we 
uh, we become more seasoned in ministry sometimes we get absorbed by our own work okay this is me this is my ministry this is my thing uh, but very important is to encourage and raise up young ministers of god so that they can rise up to the call of god look at this paul takes timothy when he is about 17 years old in a second missionary journey paul joins uh, sorry, Timothy joins Paul and Silas, and he sees the Apostle Paul in all the challenges. And Timothy was there; he didn't run away, but he was there. And now Paul is, you know, well advanced, uh, and and he's saying Timothy is a man of God. Don't despise him; he's young, right? Uh, but don't despise him because he's he does the work of the Lord, right? Uh, and he's a next leader, so. Treat him because he does the work of God, which is the same thing that I do. So Paul is not saying, uh, you know, I when I was in second missionary journey, I took him because, you know, he, he was just doing nothing much there. I felt that God could use him. So I was the one who took him. I was the one who trained him. He doesn't say all that. All that he says is he does the work of God just like how I do the work of God. Right? So he's recognizing his leadership. And later on, he writes to Timothy and say, uh, and he tells the leaders, uh, uh, and he's telling Timothy, let no one despise you for your youth, Timothy. You're the leader there. There are bishops, deacons, overseers who are much seasoned and uh, much learned than you, but you are the overseer. Don't let people despise you. Right. Uh, so that's something that we must learn, raising up leaders on a constant basis. Right. Apollos. Now, here he was an interesting person. We know that he came to uh, Corinth later on. Now, concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren. But he was quite will unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come at his, uh, at his, when, he is, when he has a convenient time. Now, Apollos, remember, he, uh, he, uh, he's there in the church in Corinth, right? And he's... People have recognized his leadership, right? And they've also said, I follow Paul, I follow Paulus. Now, Paul has recognized Apollos as a minister of God, and he's allowed him to make his decision. He's not dictating terms to him. He's not saying, Apollos, you have to go. But he's saying, I've urged Apollos to come and meet with you, the brethren, but he will come on his own time. Right, right now he's here. But he will come on his own time when in his convenient time he will come but later on apollos goes he goes to corinth right and then he ends it with the final words of exhortation he says watch stand fast in the faith be brave be strong and let all that you do be done with love uh, yes i think somebody's raising their hands yes say he has raised your hand yes go ahead say yeah, a question, sir. Uh, yes. Could, could it be that Apollos was actually fed up with the problems going on in the Church of Corinth? What do you think exactly must have um, got him, you know, reluctant to go back to the Church of Corinth? Mm. Uh, so, say, I, I feel that it would, wouldn't have been that he's fed up with the Church because we see that uh initially he was the one who came into corinth right and probably he's doing some kind of ministry where he is at uh in parts of ephesus right so maybe he also is doing a good work there he's seeing the fruit of his labor uh but we know that he's not upset with the church or angry with the church because later on he goes to corinth he and uh, uh priscilla uh uh, uh, uh aquila priscilla also joins later on uh, so apollos goes there right so uh, so we know that it, it is not that he was fed up with the church but probably he was doing something he was seeing some fruit of ministry happening in a certain place now we must understand apollos was had a very similar ministry to uh, the apostle paul right he was also as learned so he was on the move always like he wanted to see he had this Thing of teaching the word of God, equipping them. So probably he he saw a work. He wanted to stay. Like we know, right now Paul is in Ephesus. He was there for three years, just equipping the church there, 
right? So probably even he, you know, Apollos was there, uh, but the the reason is not mentioned why he didn't. Uh, but what is mentioned is that Paul does not force him, probably because there he's seeing a fruit of work that he's been. Now he's seasoned, right? Apollos is seasoned, uh, and so yes, say so. Th I would say that maybe there's some fruit that's happening in what he's doing and he didn't want to disrupt the work but paul says he will come at his convenient time and he does come at his convenient time later on as well so yes uh, okay just uh, quickly let's uh, see you raise your hand again oh so so sorry I, I i don't know if you're going to also explain the latter verse where paul says uh, if no one loves the lord let him be uh, accursed in, in Greek, I think it's Atema Maranatha. Uh, I, I don't know, somehow I was a bit thrown back, but maybe you could throw more light on why he might have made that statement. Okay, uh, which verse is this? Uh, saying? um, sure, let me let me go back to it. It's the it's this, it's the concluding part of Paul's le first letter to. Uh, First Corinthians, sixteen, verse, verse um, twenty-two. Okay, 22. okay. We we've not yet come there. We were we are still at uh, a couple of verses prior to that. Uh, oh, yes, yes. So we are at uh, verses thirteen onwards. Uh, so uh, actually, what we'll do is we'll stop because uh, we have to get to the next session. So we'll stop. We'll just do this a little bit um, uh, next class, and then we'll get into Second Corinthians. Right? We'll just bring this to a close, and we'll start with Second Corinthians next week. Right? Okay. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, it was a good time of discussion. Uh, hope you have a great week ahead. I'll see you next week. God bless you all. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. God bless. Thank you.